Welcome to module one of a course called Coding for Crosswords. In this module, we're going to talk briefly about the crossword puzzle problem and what does it mean and what are we trying to do in this course that has to do with crossword puzzles. So this is the type of crossword puzzle we're talking about. It's an American style crossword puzzle that is anything from a small toy puzzle like seven by seven up to 15 by 15 is the standard size of a New York Times or other major newspaper daily puzzle, up to the Sunday puzzle, which is a 21 by 21, and then there's some mega puzzles, even 25 by 25. Uh, this is the type of puzzle that in this course, we're trying to write software that constructs these puzzles. So you give it some seed entries, and then we want the software to do what's called autofill. But even more than autofill, we want it to actually help us in a more intelligent way build the crossword puzzle. Like for instance, even design these black squares and place the theme entries in interesting places that lead to a successful and rewarding puzzle with lots of interesting and fun words in it that are fun to clue. So let's talk a little bit about the crossword puzzle domain. There's this whole series that the New York Times put out about crossword puzzles, how to make a crossword puzzle. And it's a great series. If you haven't seen it, it's worth a read. Um, it's, it's, uh, it should be not behind their paywall, so you should be able to read this. And it's got five parts to it, and it talks all about the process from starting with the theme up to designing the grid, and then filling in the grid, and then cluing the puzzle, and then the editor's job. Sometimes people don't understand what the editor does for a crossword puzzle. They typically rewrite like half of the clues, but they don't usually mess with the characters in the grid. But understanding what the editor's job is and their role is important if you're trying to publish a crossword in the New York Times or LA Times or Boston Globe or, or Wall Street Journal. Um, so let's dive a little bit in to show you what they're doing in this particular piece. They talk about the entries and a themed puzzle. Most of the puzzles are themed, except for the really hard ones on a Friday or Saturday, which are themeless. Let's just have a whole bunch of really long words. But most of the puzzles that you're going to encounter and probably the ones you want to do for your friends and family have themes in them. They have fun entries that have either a pun or some wordplay or some answers that have some meaning to some domain of interest to you, you know, a movie you like or any kind of theme in, in pop culture. In this puzzle, they've come up with a theme that's kind of cute. It's to come up with pieces of music. So all of these things have to do with a pun kind of that means a piece of music. You know, a piece, a track, a number, an air. The air is probably the weakest of these four, but they go they go with these four. And notice that they're 11, 11 and 10 and 10 characters long. That's to achieve the symmetry that you need with a puzzle. If you look at most crossword puzzles, most of them have, what, have what's called rotational symmetry. So if you were to rotate the puzzle 180 degrees, you'll get the same uh, puzzle back again. Some of them have left-right symmetry and very occasionally you'll see an up-down symmetry um, uh, or a, a full 90 degree rotation where it's actually symmetric at every 90 degree rotation. But this one is a normal crossword symmetry which is 180 degree rotation symmetry. The point is if you're going to have a theme answer, for instance in this puzzle there's a theme answer here that's quite a lot of letters, it's 12 letters, you're going to have another theme entry down here that runs along opposite to it in the symmetric sense. So that's why that um, when they come up with these, with these themes, you have to think about the word count. Sometimes the left-right symmetry can save you uh, with themes of different length. They'll still fit nicely. But generally, uh, if you have paired length theme entries, you do better. You can also fit one in the middle sometimes. So you might have an odd number of theme entries where one goes across the middle. I'll talk about these topics a lot more in the advanced section of the course. The first 19 modules of this course are all about just very basic software. In fact, we're going to be solving this crossword puzzle. And by solving, I mean creating one. We're going to try to find all the possible words that will fit in and create this. So this is all we're doing for the first 19 modules. Nothing like those big crossword puzzles because those are quite hard to construct actually. Computationally, they can take days and days of CPU time. So. This puzzle uh, is fun, you know, and it's small enough that we can run this on a small machine and you shouldn't have a problem generating some interesting answers with this puzzle. Let's go back to their idea, though. In the article, New York Times article, they talk about this tool called Crossfire, and there are other tools such, such as this that are crossword constructor aids. And you can, this one's actually for pay. You have to pay money to get access to this tool. And it lets you um, design the grid and it helps you complete words and it has an autofill button which you can push and it will try to fill in. In fact, when they start constructing this puzzle, 
during the article, they go through this and they talk about how to lay out the puzzle. And they realize that, for instance, these two Z's here are going to be problematic. So in fact, they move them down here. They talk about how to lay these words out in a way that they've known through experience that works pretty well. You've got these blocks like this that tend to uh, create these little areas in the corner. So along the edges, you tend to get these kind of kind of little isolated regions, a little more isolated. They can't be they can't be fully isolated. Like for instance, this they discuss in the article is illegal. Every square in a crossword puzzle has to be reachable. You can't wall off anything, except for the very occasional gimmick puzzle that might have like a picture of a fish or something with a eyeball that's isolated. Otherwise, everything has to be has to be connected and every square has to be checked. Checked means that it has an answer running both horizontal and vertical through that puzzle. So you can't have a square that just sits by itself in the middle of a black area. It has to have the user, or the, the, the reader of the crossword puzzle, the solver of the crossword puzzle, has to have two chances to try to get every square of the puzzle. Uh, this is, again, the American style crossword puzzle. There are other style crossword puzzles that, uh, for which that's not true. But in this class, we're going to stick with the American style uh, for which that is true. So as they work through the article, you can see them think through the issues about where they put the black squares. And they do this all manually. All the black square design is done manually, I think, by most of the constructors. Uh, these days still. It's more of an art form. Um, and then they talk about different alternatives. Like here, for instance, they've extended, they went from the two, this square that you can either play with having, you know, having to be two deep or one deep. And then they talk about autofill and they kind of trash it. They sort of say that the autofill today is not very good. And they give this as an example. They just push the autofill button and it's my belief, I don't know the code, but it's my belief that the autofill that they're using is pretty poor. It's not doing an exhaustive search of the words. It's just finding some that fit. And the problem with this autofill, there's several problems. One is that there's a lot of repeated letters. Like, look how heavy the L's are. Like, in this section, that's kind of seen as kind of ugly, all these L's here. Um, and words like disturbers is not a word that the authors of this article think is very good. Now, sleaze bags. It's sort of funny. They kind of criticize that as being a bad word. And then when they end up designing it by hand, they end up using sleaze ball, which to me is the same, at the same level as sleaze bags. <laughs> but, but the point is they're not very happy with the control that the autofill gives the users. So one of the goals of my software project uh, is to give the user a lot more control over the point scoring of the words and over the selection of the words to, to, to nudge the autofill uh, into producing a higher quality puzzle that in fact rivals or I even think exceeds, uh, for instance, what they do here by hand in this puzzle, just because it can try many more uh, variations of both the grid design and the placement of the letters um, and all the autofill uh, answers. So then they talk about how they do it by hand. So they start kind of um, in the most packed areas, like they lay these long words out first, then they uh, work their way through the middle and go up to this other long area up here. And they know that these other corners are going to be easier, so they defer those to the end. You don't want to work on these first and then find yourself boxed in in the difficult area. So they try to attack the difficult area first. And that's the same strategy that I use later. You'll see in the advanced section, I'll talk about that. When you select which, which slot I call this to work on, it's very important to pick a slot that minimizes your chance of wandering through the permutations unnecessarily. You wanna maximize your chance of hitting a dead end. And that means you try to, just like a human would, you try to do the hardest thing first. You try to lay down the hardest words first, these long, in this case, it's a 10 digit, 10 letter word that they try to lay down together so that if there are problems laying that out, they'll find it right away and they won't have to, you know, do all this work up in the easy corners before they can find out that they're boxed in in the other corners. Um, and then they kind of keep working towards the corners and they finally get to this. Is, so this is their answer. So this is an answer that they like and they claim and it's true is better than the autofill that they generated. So that is the basic idea um, of the crossword puzzle problem and where we're going with this. Now, again, the first part of this class, the whole first 19 modules is what I call the basics section. And that won't even get to crosswords this big. It's just going to be starting with this very simple dog cat crossword, right? And just looking about how to build data structures to hold that. So we're gonna start very slow. Don't be overwhelmed by the, the big stuff. In the advanced section, we'll talk more about this. Like this is a puzzle I'm working on that is a, kind of a fun dog cat puzzle. There's a fence in the middle that I've put in. And you can see I'm putting clues in that have the word dog in it. So here's Nintendo Game Boy has a dog up here and then there's underdog, 
dogma. So there's dogs up here, there's a fence, and there's cats down here. Alcatraz, I didn't catch him. I didn't catch that. Cater. So that's an example of, of what how I use the software and look at how it's playing with different positions of those. It's playing with different grid design. Look at see in these different examples. And these are, I just snapped 12. There's It's producing millions of these possible permutations of the layout of the grid. So then the human can pick one that's pleasing to the eye. Like some of these have these, these long diagonals, which can be either desirable or undesirable, depending on what you, kind of what you prefer. Some of these have just sort of scattered black pieces, um, the, 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 block, the block squares. Um, so that's just an example of kind of where we're going in the advanced section. But for this first part of the class, this is our world. It's really the dog cat world. So having said enough about that, we will start now with module two to install the environment so that you can compile uh, the code for yourself. That's the next main task to work on. So I'll see you in the next module.